The Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and your local cable provider presents Cable Reports. Join us now as Cable Reports brings you up to date on current issues facing the Commonwealth through discussions with your local legislators and other policymakers from across Virginia. Welcome from the General Assembly and the City of Richmond. I'm Woody Evans for Cable Reports and Comcast. With the start of the 2004 General Assembly session, we are pleased to have three guests from Arlington County today. Delegate Alfonso Lopez, welcome, sir. Hello. Delegate Bob Brink, good to see you. Hi, Woody. Senator Barbara Favela, good to see you. Thank you, Woody. Pleasure to be here. Let's start with the Senate because I understand there are two vacancies there. There was a, uh, an election uh, that has been certified by nine votes. The Democrat Linwood Lewis won. But we also have an election yet to be held, I believe, January 21st. Uh, That's right. to, uh, 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 to In uh, Loudoun County in exactly. the 33rd District exactly. uh, to actually fill the seat that Mark Herring vacated. Correct, our current Attorney General. Our current Attorney General. Um, yeah, both elections are uh, yet to be determined. The uh, Linwood Lewis election, which was to fill Lieutenant Governor Ralph Northam's seat in the 6th Senatorial District, the Norfolk area, uh, although the results have been uh, certified there because the margin is so narrow, the um, uh, opponent, the, the losing candidate, does have the right to ask for a recount, and he can decide that um, over a 10-day period. So we expect that Mr. Coleman was his name. will ask for a recount on the 10th day, and then the votes will be uh, recertified again, and we'll see what the uh, the actual uh, permanent election results are. We're ahead. Um, you know, I'm not making any predictions <laughs> on what's going to happen with the recount. And on January 21st, we'll have an election in Loudoun County. Uh, you know, all the polls will be open 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. It will be in that 33rd district. Jennifer Wexton is the Democrat running and uh, she's a terrific candidate. She ran for Commonwealth's attorney and um, did a, you know, a very admirable job in that race. There are two other candidates in the race, Joe Mays, an independent, and John Whitbeck, the Republican. But in the meantime, the people's business is still being done in the Senate, and I know you're very you're very busy on a lot of issues, including uh, women's issues. Uh, yeah, we're very busy. Uh, the clerk uh, signs the bills in the Senate, and she has looked at bills that don't seem to appear to be controversial, and those are the bills that are now coming before the committees, and we're you know we're working them. Um, the the Senate, for the most part, has had a history of bipartisan. Uh, relationships so you know we're we're being cordial and civil and um, you know working these non controversial bills but certainly people are on pen, pins and needles because um, I'm going to be optimistic when the Democrats win the two open seats uh, then that would certainly shift the power arrangement in the Senate and because that, the, uh, the current lieutenant governor is a Democrat now that's correct and the lieutenant governor of course can break the tie on anything on any a bill, but a budget amendment or a constitutional amendment or a judgeship. Um, but other than that, he certainly can be the tiebreaker, and you know that that's a different, that's a very different game. Um, you know the issues facing the Senate, I think, are the issues that uh, Governor McAuliffe outlined, and to some degree, Governor McDonald, um, and you know sometimes history or circumstances elevate an issue. Uh, like our, our dear friend, Senator Cree Deeds, and the unfortunate situation he had to go through with his son. So mental health will be uh, a top priority. I know I and many lawmakers have put in bills on, in the mental health area. Um, you know, we want to ensure greater access, ensure that the safety net for mental health services is actually much stronger, and that there are you know, community-based options and not just institutional options, but when we need it, that we do have psychiatric beds. Um, and, you know, all of these issues tie into women's issues and, and children and families and ensuring that we have uh, the, the services in place so women can make wise choices when they need to access health care. Um, you know, I, I'm hopeful that maybe the TRAP regulations will be re-looked at. 
because it was a critical uh, element to women's health and their the safety net for women to have access to these clinics where they got you know birth control coverage and uh, screenings for breast cancer and a number of other services that were just so critical. Those were um, the regulations that were put in place by the McDonald's. That's correct. Yeah, by uh, Cucci by Mr. Cuccinelli was the attorney general at the time. Yeah, and they they were strictly intended to deny access to health care for women. And um, it was very, very discouraging, very uh, uh, troubling because in many parts of the state, the women's health centers were the primary uh, provider of care. So, uh, so that, you know, that's an, an, an agenda item. And of course, we have a plethora of bills that the, uh, some of the Republican, ex extreme Republican lawmakers have introduced. Um, you know, he's banning uh, insurance coverage for contraceptive, uh, contraceptives of all types, and um, that just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, you know, we've we've uh, contraceptive care is that's a that's been around for 50 years, and uh, you know, families have been able to enjoy a much higher standard of living and a higher standard of income and uh, all kinds of you know good things uh, because people are able to plan for their families. So these, these bills, Bob Marshall has introduced three of them, have got to be stopped, and we will stop them. Um, and we're going to try to repeal the uh, medically unnecessary ultrasound bill that passed uh, last year. So we've got our hands full. There's no, there's no question. Great. Now, you, you've got your hands full, too, uh, Delegate Brink, on the House side. And I know that uh, you have a great deal of interest on on health care. So talk to us about uh, Medicaid and other health related issues. Right. There are several, several front burner issues that we're going to be dealing with. Uh, I'm a member of the Health Subcommittee of Appropriations. Uh, one of them, as you mentioned, is the question of whether or not we're going to expand health care coverage to up to 400,000 Virginians uh, through, uh, through the Medicaid program under the Affordable Care Act. This is very important from a number of respects. First of all, uh, the effect that it would have on those individuals, getting them into a stable medical home is, is very important for them and, and for their well-being. But on top of that, this is really an economic development and a jobs issue in a lot of respects. Um, there are a number of communities uh, where health care is, is one of the primary, if not the primary, uh, employer. Uh, expansion of, of Medicaid to, uh, to those folks would add as many as 30 to 33,000 jobs across the Commonwealth. On top of that, uh, the, the economic viability of, of uh, a lot of towns and cities across the Commonwealth hangs in the balance. Uh, if we do not expand Medicaid in this manner, there's a good possibility that, that uh, people would be going to emergency departments for their care uh, and that this would really have a severe economic impact on those hospitals if they have to, uh, to pick up that burden. We've already had one hospital in uh, rural Virginia down in Lee County that closed and uh, it, it's a, a, a very serious situation in, in towns and cities across the state. So on a health care basis, on an economic development basis, and on an equity basis for Virginia's taxpayers, it's important that we proceed along these lines. Otherwise, Virginia taxpayers are going to be paying for the health care in other states and not getting the benefit of it. So I'm, I'm very hopeful that uh, we'll be able to make the economic development the fairness and the health care argument and move forward uh, during this session. And of course, uh, this, go ahead. We're basically you know, turning down two point, over $2.1 billion a year for the first three years. That comes out to $5 million a day that we're just not going to have access to. And of course, this was the supporting expansion in other 25 other states. Yes. Right. And this was <coughs> the subject of the governor's remarks, among other things. He talked about uh, mm -hmm. uh, yesterday to the uh, General Assembly in terms of expediting the commission that has been examining the, the, the reforms that the General Assembly thought at least last year were necessary in order to accept these funds. That's right. I have a budget amendment in that would, that would carry out what the governor was talking about, which is basically to say thank you very much for, for bringing these reforms to the fore and getting them 
on the road to implementation. It would leave this uh, this commission, this Medicaid Innovation and Reform Commission, uh, to uh, to oversee the the carrying out of of those reforms. But still, the major thing is it would get us into expansion uh, by the first of July of 2014, so that we can. Uh, 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 reap the benefits of it, including that five million dollars a day that uh, Alfonso referred to. So, Duncan Lopez, wh what you're saying is that the taxpayers of Virginia will not reap the benefits of the money they the money they've already sent to Washington. That's exactly right. And it's five million dollars a day. You say mm -hmm. that's that's quite a bit of money. So, of money. why is there opposition to to this? In your opinion, I won't actually venture to guess what uh, some of the opposition is, but I, I, from a, from my perspective. We need, we have an opportunity to bring so many people out of a position of un instability where they don't have health care, where we can provide affordable health care to folks and, and bring them out of that, that, that situation where they might, if they are struck down with a, 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 a tragic disease, be in a position where it could ruin them financially. We don't want that. Now, this would also include, Delegate Brink, uh, people who are who are not insured, for example, childless adults, as I understand it. That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. And and it's very important to uh, to get them into a stable kind of medical situation. Much of uh, the one of the most important aspects of this is to be able to to catch conditions and diseases early on where they can be treated much less expensively than if they if they're if they're left without without care and attention. And, and so all of these folks are working. I mean, these are working Virginians who are contributing to our economy, who are helping our tourist industry, who every day, uh, you know, get up in the morning and do the right thing, yet they don't have enough money to pay to go to a doctor, which is why they're going to the emergency room at the point where the care is most costly and we're getting the worst outcomes. So there, there are many, many reasons why we need to move forward. You know, uh, last year the whole conversation got wrapped around a political debate. Uh, it was part of Obamacare, and uh, Governor McDonald, of course, had his eye on higher office. Um, and so they, they didn't want to give any credibility to Obamacare. And uh, that certainly was a theme that was going through the General Assembly at the time, that's very difficult to counter because that's philosophically been ill-advised and ill-informed, but nonetheless it's, it's a philosophy and you couldn't counter that with the overwhelming uh, amount of facts that would suggest that you should actually participate in the program. I, I call it, well, you know, I call it health care for working Virginians. Mm -hmm. Ideology should not be trumping helping helping people in need help obviously a huge issue but I know that there's a matter you carried last session you're carrying it again another issue dealing with fairness and equity about our young students who happen to be immigrants through no fault of their own mm -hmm. talk to us about that the Virginia dream and tuition equity act is something I care deeply about um, I uh, I made a promise to my my district and my my, my community that I would put in uh, the Virginia dream act every year It'd be my first bill until it becomes the law of the Commonwealth we're talking about children who, as you say, were brought here by no fault of their own, who essentially know no other country, no other state than Virginia and the United States, who have played by the rules, who've done incredibly well in school, and cannot continue their education because of in-state and out-of-state issues. What's going on right now is we have, um, we have these kids who are brought here and are, are doing what they need to be doing and they do incredibly well and we're on the hook to, to basically educate them from K through 12 and then we put up a big stop sign saying that we, you shouldn't go further. The thing is this, the Virginia Dream Act had in eight years it's been in the House of Delegates never got out of subcommittee. Last year working across the aisle we were able to get it unanimously out of subcommittee and then we got it 17 to 4 out of the full education committee with 18 hours to go before crossover the bill was killed by, take, by sending it to appropriations. It really had no fiscal impact, but they still sent it to appropriations. We're very lucky that, Pres or that uh, Governor McAuliffe has actually mentioned it now in his State of the Commonwealth Address and in the inaugural address, saying this is something that we should be doing because it's the right thing to do by these kids. Business leaders, education pr uh, uh, officials, teachers, college presidents, um, chambers of commerce, 
are all for this for numerous, numerous reasons. It's not just a moral issue. It's an economic development issue. If Virginia is going to be competing against other states and other countries for the best talent, we need to keep the best talent here. If these kids who, like I say, through no fault of their own, are playing by the rules, do incredibly well in school, and they can't go to UVA because they can't afford in-state tuition, and they, can't, and they can't go to George Mason because they can't afford in-state tuition, but are getting full rides to go to college in the Northeast or other states, well, then they're going to stay in those other states. And we've spent literally millions of dollars educating these kids from K through 12, and then they're going to take that talent and they're going to use it in other parts of the country. And here's the thing about this bill. It's not blanket. It's not an easy hurdle to get over. This is incredibly hard. You have to prove that you, first off, say I live in California and I move to Virginia. I can get in-state tuition after I live here for one year and prove domicile by paying taxes for one year. For these kids, they have to prove that they pay taxes for three years or their parents. They have to have been approved by the Department of Homeland Security's Deferred Action Program and been accepted into that program. And then they also have to have been accepted to a college in, in Virginia and prove that they graduate from a high school in Virginia. These are incredibly high bars and very difficult bars. Also, we're limiting the number of students who actually are eligible for this program. There's a, only around 30,000 kids who are ever going to be eligible because they have to be, be 16 years of age and been in, in, the, in Virginia in 2007. So right now, around 9,000 students are eligible. 7,000 have been approved, but only around 5 to 10 percent of those kids are actually going to go to, uh, go to college. So we're literally talking about maybe 700, 800, 900 students across Virginia. But these are incredible kids. They are incredible students. They're the talent that will make us an economic engine for the future. And we need to be embracing them, not putting up stop signs. Great, great. Is there a companion bill in the Senate? Uh, there's not a companion bill that there I'm aware of. Oh, there is. There is. Okay, okay, terrific. Senator McEachin and, okay. and Senator Evan have it must the have bill. It must have just Great. been put Great. in. Great. It, the, the bill has passed several times if, in the Senate. <coughs> Actually, it's it passed twice in the, the Senate. Yeah, the challenge has been in the House. So, you know, there was a strategy to, well, let the bill get out of the House and then we'll mm -hmm. act on it. Mm -hmm. So it, the Senate is really not the, uh, the problem here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it... This, it, it's time has come, right. and I, I do agree with Delegate Lopez that I, I believe that during the, the next two years, uh, we'll see this bill come out. De Delegate Brink, uh, our training center, some are being closed slowly as a result of a settlement with the Department of Justice. I think everybody recognizes it's better to have people in a home environment as opposed to an institution, but there have been a lot of complaints about it. Tell us where things are now. There's a tremendous amount of concern over... Uh, uh, the the uh, way that uh, the, the uh, state is going about closing these training centers and uh, what's happening to the affected individuals. These are people with severe intellectual disabilities. Many of them have um, uh, serious medical issues as well as behavioral issues. And it's very, very tough to find uh, the, the proper kind of community uh, s uh, support systems in order for them to live in the community, which, as you said, is, is much more desirable. Uh, and so I'm, I'm looking at proceeding more cautiously down this road. I'm, I'm particularly concerned about the Northern Virginia Training Center, uh, which uh, houses a number of people who've been there for many years. Very often these are people who are uh, in their 40s or 50s. Their parents are are uh, aging, and they're very concerned about what's going to happen to uh, to their kid when they're no longer able to, to oversee their care. So uh, we're working on that to, to try to make sure that there are adequate uh, uh, providers in the community to, uh, to, to make a good fit with these individuals to, to give them the kind of, of uh, uh, life that they, that they deserve. Great. I know you go ahead. No, I was just going to say, you know, certainly in Northern Virginia, the cost of actually uh, providing a community-based 
program, which would be a group home with you know four to six individuals in it, is extraordinarily costly. You know, we have to buy land. We have to, uh, you know, the work paying the workforce would be much more expensive. So this is just not as easy a. Uh, uh, goal as you might mm -hmm, think mm -hmm. and you don't want individuals to end up in in substandard care or to be isolated in a group home where you know they never get out into the community the Northern Virginia Training Center if any of you have visited has you know um, has an incredible program for folks that you know they integrate them into the community mm -hmm. they have a good day program they take them out they make sure they have experiences that you know enable them to to use their skills to the maximum possible level. So, uh, so it's a tough choice for parents because they do have something that is a desirable service and they need to try to match that in the community and we're having a hard time creating the capacity at the level that needs, it needs to be created. Sure, and these, go ahead. Do you want to say something? Uh, I think at this point uh, there, there's a timetable that, they, that uh, the department set up for closure of these institutions and it had the Northern Virginia Training Center closing as of July 115. I think at this point it's pretty clear that, uh, that that's an unrealistic timetable. We've basically, uh, we're out of runway uh, for mm -hmm. preparation uh, uh, to, uh, to provide the services that uh, the individuals in that training center would need. And so that's one of the things we need to look at is uh, what is realistic, what's doable, uh, from now on and and to make sure that the that the needs and wishes of the residents uh, of those training centers and their families are are uh, complied with so I know there are there are other matters of of importance to you but beyond the dream act, especially in terms of housing right. uh, discrimination of people who have different sexual orientations. Talk to us about those issues well the, I have a, a few affordable housing bills last year I was able to pass um, the Affordable Housing Trust Fund um, in Virginia. And I'm very proud of that. We set aside 80% uh, uh, in a revolving loan fund for uh, affordable housing programs and 20% uh, for homelessness um, remediation issues and for organizations across the state. Um, the issue now is um, actually creating a dedicated source of funding for that Affordable Housing Trust Fund. You know, California's got $1.9 billion with a B in their trust fund. We have $8 million. Mm -hmm. The issue now is not just getting um, uh, a set aside every year from the Appropriations Committee right now. I think the budget has $4 million for um, the Affordable Housing Trust Fund and each year the biennial budget and then an addi additional million. Um, but I'm trying to get a dedicated source of funding that we could always have there. That could involve several different things. It could be you know, if there's a surplus on a recreation uh, tax is over and above a target for each year, they could take a percentage of that and put it into um, the trust fund. Or it could sure. be something simpler. It could be simply for every year that there's a surplus, we get 2% of the surplus capped at, say, $10 million a year. Um, it's something, a small step in the right direction to start really putting more oomph into, the oomph, that's a technical term, uh -huh, uh, into the affordable housing trust fund. Um, at the same time, there are things that we could be doing with discriminatory practices in housing, uh, not the least of which is actually ad adding LGBT issues into the discriminatory practices and making sure we don't allow that in the Commonwealth. Ethics reform, that's been in the news for quite a while, and I know yeah. that's, that's a matter uh, that's before the, the Senate and the House. Uh, some people are a little concerned that uh, um, it's a problem that may cause folks to go overboard. I want to get your opinion on what needs to be done from your perspective. Well, I, I do think we need an ethics bill. Uh, I, um, I think this past situation with uh, Governor McDonald demonstrated that you just can't trust everybody's judgment or you get into situations where uh, folks don't really realize that it seems a little extreme to be taking, you know, $159,000 from one, one uh, donor. Um, so the question that the General Assembly is debating is, is if we come up with a limit, do we apply it across the board to all gifts, including meals and travel, or should we allow for some exceptions? Uh, and then should we set up a commission to sort of monitor this or give advice to lawmakers about what would meet the ethics, the new ethics law and what wouldn't? Um, 
and you know it's sort of a new path for Virginia to go down because you know we are a state that had traditionally has had a open government and a fairly clean government in the sense that folks know who's donating to you and you know you could easily determine that and we have great reporting requirements um, so it's really a question of what where does that limitation go where does that judgment uh, need to be applied. You know, it's one of those things. It's like pornography. You, it's hard to define, but you know it when you see it. Well, we're having the same trouble with the ethics bill. You know, it's hard to define, but we'd know it if we saw yeah, it. The, the issue here also so, is that you can drive a Mack truck through the holes in our, in our ethics, ethics laws right now. And it's tied in not just with ethics, but also with, you know, campaign finance, finance issues as well. I mean, I think the basics that we can build off of is that we definitely need an ethics commission. We definitely need to expand um, uh, giving limitations to, in, to you know, personal family members as well as the elected le leaders themselves, and then we need a cap of at least, you know, a hundred dollars to two hundred fifty dollars. Yeah, I cap in for a hundred dollars, uh, but I, my bill actually excludes working meals, which, mm -hmm. you know, don't usually come up to that amount. Oh, uh, they'd still have to be reported, mm -hmm. um, but for practicality's sake, you know, lawmakers, we're, we work 16 hours a day, we, we sometimes sit down with people who need to brief us or need to talk to us about an issue, and, it, you know, we want to be able to have that meal and not, um, you know, worry about who's check, who's paying for it, <laughs> you know, I can't go to that restaurant, I can go to, go to this restaurant, because so, so that's, you know, that's in play, but uh, otherwise my cap would apply across the board. Delegate Brink, I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about that as well. The governor issued an executive order, which is more stringent than the legislation that's been introduced, as, as I understand it. But also wanted to give you an opportunity. We've got about two minutes left to talk about a bill you have in regarding the Attorney General's office. Right. Uh, what we're talking about here is basically transparency and the people's confidence in the integrity of their government. And I have a couple of bills in that address that as a follow-on to some of the experiences we had last year with uh, uh, then Attorney General Cuccinelli. One of them would make clear that the office of the Attorney General is subject to the Freedom of Information Act as the, as the rest of the government is. Uh, the then Attorney General uh, issued an opinion that, that diverged from that. The other one would make clear that when uh, uh, the Attorney General is a candidate for office, uh, that, that he should recuse himself from activities and advice involving the State Board of Elections. This goes to the people's confidence that, uh, that the laws are being administered fairly and, and forthrightly. And so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to see movement on both of those issues. I'm going to give the, the senator the last word. I think uh, the governor indicated last night that he's heard a lot about the standards of learning. We've got less than 30 seconds. so. Uh, there will be some uh, bills that will pass the General Assembly this year that will reform the standards of learning. There is a movement that is out there and has gained a lot of friends. There's, uh, I would say, common knowledge now that the standards of learning should test a child's ability to think and reason Great. and not memorize. Great. Thank you all for being here. Delegate Lopez, Brink, Senator Favola. Thank you for watching Cable Reports, brought to you by the Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and Comcast. Until next time, I'm Woody Evans. Mm -hmm.